Welcome to 721 Live, the video arm of 721 Ministries. I'm Sam Hunter. I'm glad that you're with us. Thank you for joining us today. It is Easter week. And have you ever taken that week and walked through the gospel stories of Jesus' final days, starting with Sunday, that triumphal entry, what we call Palm Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Thursday night being the Last Supper. Have you ever done that? Because there are so many gems that we can just mine out of this, and, and that's what we're going to do today. We're going to look at each day and see what we think about what Jesus is doing. I do this every year. It is so helpful. I think you're going to really enjoy this. You stay tuned. We'll be right back. Each year, when Easter rolls around, I send out, and you can go to our website and send us an email, sam at 721ministries.org, sam at 721ministries.org, and I'll send it to you. It's, a, it's a, a description of what Jesus is doing each day, his final week. And I read these each one of the gospel accounts, I read those on month, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Sunday morning, I actually read each one of the gospel accounts because it, it just draws me closer to Jesus. And I, and I feel like I'm experiencing the week with him. I'm walking through the week with him. So that's what we're going to do today. And I think you'll find this interesting and helpful, but it does draw me closer to Jesus. And I do want to say this so that I don't forget. On Thursday night, when Jesus is arrested, somewhere around midnight, 1 o'clock, somewhere along in there, I set my clock, for the, my alarm, excuse me, for the middle of the night so that I can wake up and spend a little time awake being with Jesus because it's a terrible night for him. It's an awful night. He's being beaten. Uh, he's being dragged around from one spot to the next. He's flogged. And I just, I just want to be a part of that. So I would encourage you to think about doing that. So what we're going to do today is we're going to hit the highlights of what Jesus did each day of this final week. Now, what I want to show you is a picture of Bethany. Bethany was Jesus' favorite place. I read a little book that was entitled Jesus' Favorite Place on Earth. And we see him in Bethany so often during the gospel, the gospel descriptions. Martha and Mary and Lazarus, brother and two sisters, lived in Bethany. Their father, Simon the leper, they all lived together. And we see Jesus coming back here over and over. And during this final week, each night he goes back out to the Mount of Olives to Bethany, and each day he comes back into the city, which is what many of the Jews would have done, the same thing. There were so many Jews, hundreds of thousands, that came to Jerusalem for Passover, and many would have camped out on the Mount of Olives, which was right across the Kidron Valley from the city of Jerusalem. I've been there. It, it's less than a mile, and it sits right up there and looks out over. So if you could just picture Jesus coming back and forth each day, to this city of Bethany. This picture was taken in the 1940s, and so it gives you a better representation of getting back at least before it was really commercialized. So Jesus is going back and forth each day, and on the first day of this week, starting with Sunday, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, here's what jumps out at me on that. As Jesus is entering Jerusalem, as the Lamb of God, the Jews are selecting their Passover lamb to be slaughtered on Passover, the same day Jesus will be crucified. You see, on that Sunday, all the Jews who had come to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover, their biggest time of the year, which of course celebrates when the angel passed over the Israelite homes because they had painted blood across the top of their doorways during that last and final tenth plague so they could come out of Egypt. During this time, they're selecting their lambs, which are they're going to then slaughter on that same day that Jesus is crucified. On, on Passover day, the day before Passover, they're going to slaughter those lambs. And it's interesting, a little, little interesting note on this. They, bring, they select the lamb on Sunday. 
they bring the lamb into their homes. They don't leave it tied up outside during the week. No, it comes into their home, and they spend that week with that lamb. Now, just imagine what this would do to the, for the family when it came time to slaughter this lamb. The little children who've had this, they've probably given the lamb a name at this point. And it's interesting direction from our Heavenly Father that he wants them to do this, and one can only conclude that he wants them to feel the pain that he felt putting his own son up for that sacrifice. So on this triumphal entry, there are a couple of things that jump out at me. One of them is as Jesus is coming down, he pauses and he weeps. He weeps loudly. He wails is what the, the Greek word that's used there. He wails and he says this, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, if you had only known that which would bring you peace but you would not have it. And I got to tell you, I think about this so often. It's what I want to say to so many men that we deal with. If you only knew what it is that would bring you peace, you think that more money will bring you peace. You think that more job security or, or, or advances in your career will bring you peace. You think that having the right wife and the right children, the right country club membership, whatever it is, every decision we make in life is in some form seeking peace. I've learned that over all these years. We're seeking peace, and we don't know where to find it. Jesus is saying, and he weeps. And he would be weeping over watching his children today, his creation, when they're looking for peace in all the wrong places. So he, he wails. Now, the other thing that jumps out at me about this triumphal entry was the fact that the crowds were singing Hosanna. They were praising Jesus. It was, a, it was an eruption an organic eruption of praise and worship and love. And then we hear so often, how could this crowd be so fickle as to turn around just a few days later and yell out, crucify him, crucify him? And I've heard this many times over the years. It's not the same crowd. These are a bunch of normal Jews who are out on the Mount of Olives watching this procession, being caught up in the, uh, the emotions of the moment. When we fast forward to that early Friday morning, when we've got that, that is a little small group that the Jewish leaders, the Jewish authorities have pulled together. The average Jew visiting Jerusalem or living in Jerusalem is not awake this early in the morning. Remember, the, the Jewish leaders had to get this trial done at the crack of dawn because they were trying to get it done before the Jewish people came back into the city, which would have been about 9 o'clock. So it's not the same crowd. It's a crowd that has been handpicked to do exactly what the Jewish leaders wanted. As a matter of fact, when you read the gospel stories, as Jesus is being led out to the cross, we read that the crowds are coming in, and now they're suddenly seeing what's happening, and this is the man they were just a few days before praising and worshiping, and now he's being led out on a cross after, being, after having been whipped 39 times. So it's not the same crowd. So remember that. It's two different sets of people. So that's Sunday. On Monday, he goes in and he clears the temple. This is what happens. We can read about this in all the gospel accounts. But there's a couple of things that jump out at me about him clearing the temple. One, remember there were two main religious groups in, in Judaism. There were the Sadducees and the Pharisees. The Sadducees were the religious, excuse me, the wealthy elite. They were the wealthy elite, and they ran the temple. You could call it Temple Inc., because they made a lot of money off the temple. So the Sadducees were the elite, the wealthy, and they ran the temple. The Pharisees, some were rich, some were average or normal. They all had jobs. But they were the ones that were sticklers for the law, and that's why they argued so many times with Jesus about these finer points of the law. But when he goes into the temple and kicks it over and kicks all the money changers tables and frees the animals, he's taking on the Sadducees. That's who he's going after. It's a very, I, I know he's doing this through emotion. I know he is so upset at seeing all this going on in his father's house. But at the same time, he's taking on the wealthy elite of Jerusalem, the Sadducees. And during this time, he says, and he's quoting an Isaiah chapter passage where he says, You've made my father's house into a house of robbers when it was supposed to be a house of prayer. A house of prayer. Now, the actual statement, the passage back in Isaiah, is a house of prayer for all nations. But Matthew doesn't say that. 
nor does Luke say that. They just say, they have Jesus saying, a house of prayer. Well, John, excuse me, Mark does include the full quotation, a house of prayer for all nations. That has always stuck with me, that all the way back in the Old Testament, God is saying, this is a house of prayer for everyone. Matthew doesn't say that, and my guess is Matthew is Jewish. He's writing to Jews. He is He's framing Jesus as the new king, and he's not really that interested, and I'm just speculating, but he's not really that interested in this being a house of prayer for all nations. Luke, I'm surprised that he doesn't because he's writing to the Greco-Roman world, but remember that Mark was inspired and took notes from Peter. And I find it interesting that Peter wanted to be sure that Mark had in his gospel. No, he said it, it's a house of prayer for all nations because that's what the temple, and that is who our Heavenly Father is for everyone. Even when the Jews were his, his selected people, his beloved people, it was still a house of prayer for all nations. So that's Monday. Between Monday and Tuesday, it's a little bit vague as to when he curses the fig tree. But what's not vague, vague is what he says to the fig tree as he curses it. He goes over and he sees no fruit and only leaves. And so he curses the fig tree, and the things that he says in that moment are clearly, clearly directed towards the religious elite, because he says, you've got all these leaves, but you can have no fruit. And when I think about the people that I know, and even at times in my own life, we have a lot of leaves. We look pretty, and we've got a lot of activities. And so we look real religious and really like a good Christian, but is there fruit? Because Jesus is not happy with someone, or certainly a tree, that's all leaves and no fruit. Now, we're going to go to Tuesday. Now, I have to tell you that we, Tuesday is the day. Jesus comes into Jerusalem on Tuesday, and he spends the whole day there, and part of the day he is, he is doing intellectual and biblical jockeying with the, with the Pharisees, with the Sadducees, with the Herodians, and none of these three groups got along but they came together to try to destroy Jesus. He spends time going back and forth in debates with them. He gets into a woe are you to the Pharisees, which we'll talk about in just a moment. It's a day that is chock full. If you go to Matthew, there's so much red ink on, on Tuesday. What, what he's doing, and I, I want you to be clear on this, and I really want you to know this, and I, and I want to say this hopefully several times, He's making sure that he's going to be crucified at the end of that week. He's going to leave them no room, no wiggle room to get out of this. I mean, they're mad at him. They hate him. But the, I don't know that they had reached the conclusion that they have to crucify him, which, of course, they have to have the room, Romans do. But Jesus is not going to give them any option to get out of this. Here's what I want you to hear. The cross did not happen to Jesus. Jesus happened to the cross. The cross did not happen to Jesus. He was not a victim. He pushed this. He set forth to make this happen. The cross did not happen to Jesus. Jesus happened to the cross. And I was thinking about this, and, and I, I don't know that this is, this is certainly not biblical, but it occurred to me as I was thinking and contemplating this, and what I want you to do when you read the scriptures is put yourself there in the moment so that it's not just a newspaper account, but that there's more 3D to it, and it comes to life. I would guess that during the first two and a half years of Jesus' ministry, he, he knew he was going to be crucified. He knew he would be the ultimate sacrifice, but he didn't know when. And he said more than once, I don't know what the Father, the Father knows, I don't know. So in his humanity, he didn't know when over those first, say, two and a half years of his ministry, but then he started to understand that the, this Passover is going to be it. And we read in the Gospels where he set his face like flint towards Jerusalem. So when he comes into Jerusalem, he, as he's coming to Jerusalem, as he's traveling to Jerusalem for Passover, and as he's entering Jerusalem, he now knows this is it. This is what was prophesied. prophesied, prophesied. This is what I've, I've come for, and this is the week, and I'm going to make it happen. So on Tuesday, let's look at the various things that happen. He, authority, the authority, his authority is challenged in the temple. He teaches and confronts the Jewish leaders. The Greeks come and ask to see him, and he said, no, no, that time has passed. And he gives what we call the Olivet Discourse, which is another big, thick section of red ink. And then he starts in on the Pharisees. 
Now, what I did in the men's groups this week is I put a group of men, I had them stand over on one side of the room, and I said, these are the Pharisees. And I had all the other men standing or sitting and watching, and I said, now, I want you to understand that Jesus is doing this. He's saying these things to the Pharisees while all these normal Jewish people are milling around the temple. It's perfectly clear that that is the setting. And he shames these Pharisees so badly, he leaves them no option but to come back swinging. You see, in this culture, which was an honor-shame culture, and that was huge. I and mean, we have a somewhat of that in our own culture today, but it's nothing compared to the Middle Eastern honor-shame. I mean, sometimes we read about a father killing his daughter through an honor killing because she's gone off and gotten pregnant out of wedlock or whatever, and that, that honor and shame is so pervasive as it was for the Jews, as it was for the Pharisees. And when you were shamed in public like Jesus is getting ready to do with these Pharisees, your only way to regain honor was to outshame the person who shamed you. There's no other way to regain your honor than to show that person is more shameful than you. And the only way the Pharisees could do that was to have him crucified. To run him out of town would not have done it. That wasn't enough. Perhaps to even stone him would not have been enough. To get him hanging on a Roman cross, the shame of that, hanging up there naked, beaten to death, everyone watching it, that was the only way the Pharisees could regain their honor. And that's why he pushed them into the corner that he did. So let's just look at some of the things he said and imagine him talking directly to the Pharisees and to the Jewish, the normal Jewish population that's milling around the temple. And then you put yourself in the place of the Pharisees and think about what you'd have to do if somebody's talking to you like this in public. So he starts off, woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You travel over land and sea to win a single convert, and when you have succeeded, Listen to what he says next. You make them twice as much a child of hell as you are. He just called the Pharisees twice as much a child of hell. He just called the Pharisees a child of hell. Now imagine in your church, and you've got the bishop, or you've got the leadership there, and, and a young pastor comes up and starts telling them that they are going to hell, they're sons of hell, they are a child of hell. Imagine what kind of chaos that would be. That's what Jesus is doing. He keeps going. Woe to you blind gods. Woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees. You hypocrites, you blind gods. I'm leaving out a lot of the filler that he's, that he's saying to them. I'm just giving you the, the real insults. Woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees. You hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish. But inside, they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisees, woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to be people as righteous, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Now, Jesus just called them full of dead bones and unclean. The Pharisees, their, in, their, their entire mission in life was to remain ceremoniously clean. They were never going to let themselves be unclean. Dead bones, that was unclean. For Jesus to call them unclean, whitewashed tombs, white, whitewashed tombs, are you kidding? Now, they're standing there. Can you, can you imagine what's going on for them right now? with the other normal Jewish people watching this, watching this young itinerant rabbi just getting after them, he's not done yet. Excuse me, let me go back to here. Woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you snakes, you brood of vipers, and listen to how he concludes this attack. How will you escape being condemned to hell? He just said they're going to hell. I mean, he started off saying they're child, children of hell. Now he's saying they're going to hell. He gives them no choice but to come back out, not just swinging, but they've got to get him crucified. They have been humiliated. They have been shamed in public in front of all these people that hold them with such high regard. This is purposeful. This is intentional. 
Jesus is not going to give them any wiggle room. He's forcing their hand. The cross did not happen to Jesus. Jesus happened to the cross. Now, chapter 24. As they're leaving the temple area, the disciples say, boy, look at this temple. And Jesus says, it's going to come crashing down. And he starts giving us, talking to us about the signs of the end times. And he says, I don't know when they're coming, but when they do come, and this is what has stuck with me ever since I read this 25 years ago. He said, when the Son of Man returns, he will return on the clouds with his angels. There'll be a gigantic trumpet blast, blast and everyone will know that I'm coming back. Every, all four corners of this entire planet are going to see Jesus coming back. And then he says, so if you hear rumors about someone like me, do not believe it, because it's not me. If you hear rumors of a miracle worker or someone who's just like me, it's, it's not me. And I've often thought that if I were living in those times and someone appeared before me and they said they were Jesus and they healed somebody from the dead right there in front of me, performed miracles right in front of me and said, Sam, I'm Jesus, I'm Jesus, the man you've been following all these years, I'd say, no, you're not. No, you're not. Because you told us in the scriptures not to believe anyone that came up that way, came up to us that way or that we heard about, because when you come back, you're coming back. And everybody on the planet is going to know. So, you know, if, if any of us ever find ourselves in that situation, just remember his words. You'll know it when I'm coming back. That's chapter 24. And as he concludes that, he moves into chapter 25. This is all still going on on, on Tuesday. And he, and he says, now, based on the fact that I'm coming back, but you don't know when I'm coming back, let me give you some warnings. So he gives them three parables. And the first parable is the parable of the ten virgins. There's a bridesmaid coming. They need to keep their lamps lit. Five of them run out of oil. They don't, they're, not, they're not ready. And it doesn't seem like it's that big a deal. I mean, they certainly aren't bad people for just not being ready. But look what Jesus says to them. Later, the others also came, the five that didn't have their lamps trimmed with oil. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. Which is exactly what he says in Matthew 7, 21 and 22 and 23. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know when the day or the hour. You just don't know when I'm coming back. And what I conclude from this, my takeaway for this is, he said, don't drift and don't get distracted. Stay focused, because you know when I'm coming back. And none of this is a salvation issue. It's how we live out our lives. Don't drift. Do not get distracted. And then he gives us the parable of the talents, where you're familiar with this. He says he gives one man five talents, another two, another one. It's the one that I want to focus on who did not use his talents. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Use what I've given you, Jesus is saying, and you'll even be given more. But whoever does not have, does not use what I've given them, even what they have will be taken from them. And listen to what he says in verse 30. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus, isn't that a little harsh? I mean, he just didn't utilize his talents. So you're going to throw him out into the darkness for that? But what I hear Jesus saying is, no, I've gifted you. Don't waste the talents that I've given you. Don't waste the gifts that I've given you. Use them. Use them for the kingdom. And when I think about Sam, when I was born again at 38, all my life I had been gifted. He'd given me a lot of natural talents, a good personality, a good brain that all I got from my parents, all of it, all the credit goes to my parents for any of these good things. But I use them to further the kingdom of Sam. It's just that simple. I was the great apostle for Sam. And I shudder to think what it would have looked like had I, been, had I confronted Jesus or he confronted me in that time. He would have said, you worthless servant. You didn't use any of these gifts I gave you for my kingdom or for other people. You did it all for yourself. So as I conclude this second warning in chapter 25 on Tuesday, Jesus is saying, I've give, I've give, each one of you today, listening to me, you've been given gifts. Don't waste them on the culture. Don't waste them on temporal things. 
Use what he's given you to make some investment and advancement into the kingdom. Then he gives the last one, the sheep and the goats. And if you recall the parable, the sheep were the ones that actually did what Jesus wanted them to do. They visited people when they were sick. They visited people in jail. They clothed those who didn't have clothes. They took care of the poor. They took care of the widows and the orphans. The goats did none of these things. So he concludes with this. He will reply, I truly, I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Jesus is very clear. Take care of my people. Take care of my people. There are widows out there. There are orphans out there. There are poor that can, cannot advance themselves. There are those who are in prison. There are those who are sick. There are those, those who are homeless that don't have clothes that, that are pitiful in life. Help them out. And he doesn't pat anybody on the back and say, I, I know you just missed that. I know you were good, kind of a good person and all that. No, he says, they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. It's not a salvation issue, but he's real serious about helping his people. So this is Tuesday. How do you feel if you're part of this whole, of this whole teaching, this whole setting in the temple? This all takes place on Tuesday. When we move to Wednesday, the Bible doesn't really address it, what happens on Tuesday. But we can, we can sort of surmise that this is when Mary, at dinner that night, anointed Jesus' head and, and feet. And this is when Judas gets upset, and he says, why is this money being wasted? And then he leaves and goes and makes a bargain to betray Jesus. Now, I'm going to tell you what I think, and it's, it's somewhat, you can see it in the scriptures. See, Judas was not from Galilee. He was not like the other, ele other 11 disciples. Judas was a zealot. We can conclude that. And he, he knew Jesus was, was the Messiah. And he, like every other Jew, thought that the Messiah would be like a, a conquering king like David. And so when Jesus is being anointed by Mary and he says, do not bother her, She's anointing me for death. Judas suddenly realizes, no, he really means it when he says he's going to die. He really means it when he says he's going to be crucified. I'm not going to let that happen. I'm, I don't think Judas meant to betray Jesus in the sense that he would be crucified because we see the enormous, overwhelming remorse that he had when he realized what had happened. He gave the money back, crying out, hung himself, not giving him a pass on this, I'm just giving you some of the background and what's going on on Wednesday. So now the stage is set, and we come to Thursday. You know, Maundy Thursday is called Maundy Thursday because Maundy means new, and Jesus that night gives them a new command. Love one another as I have loved you. On Thursday, we had the Seder meal. That's the Jewish meal for Passover. It lasts three to four hours. They have four cups of wine. It starts at dusk. So we can cut the disciples who fell asleep in the Garden of Gethsemane a little slack for falling asleep after a three to four hour meal with four glasses of wine. Jesus speaks to the disciples in the upper room. We won't cover that today. Jesus struggles in Gethsemane. We know that struggle. He is arrested around midnight or 1 a.m. We go through Friday or in the middle of the night, early morning. He's got the trial by the Jews, by the Roman authorities. He's denied by Peter and he's crucified. And then Sunday, we have the resurrection. Now, there's one thing that I want to say about his crucifixion, and, and this comes out on our putting green, which we send out every Thursday, and you can sign up for that. When Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's not saying that God has forsaken him. He's quoting Psalm 22. Jesus never addressed his heavenly father as God. He always addressed him as father. No, he's quoting Psalm 22, and he's doing this to say, between his gasping breast as he hangs on the cross, it may look like my God has forsaken me, but this is exactly the opposite. He is right here with me. So go back and read Psalm 22 and watch how many of those passages in Psalm 22 show up in this moment at the cross. He's, he is absolutely 100% not saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He wants his Jewish followers to, to understand he's not forsaken me. As bad as this looks, 
No, just go read Psalm 22. So here we've gone through the week, and we've seen everything Jesus was doing that day. I want to conclude by looking at the, at the layout for the Last Supper, the table layout. It's called a triclinium table. It's the Last Supper. And Jesus says this at that night, the greatest among you will be your servant, for those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exhausted. exalted. That's the theme of what he is doing very purposely in the seating arrangement for the Last Supper. Now, here's what we know. This is the triclinium table, because you can see that is it in effect three tables. We will look at how, through the scriptures, how we can be certain where John was sitting, where Jesus was sitting, where Judas was sitting, and where Peter was sitting. And let me go ahead and tell you, before we look at the passages, Jesus is in the traditional host seat. He's the host, and he directs the entire meal. John is sitting to his right, and he's in the right-hand man's position. Now, let me correct myself real quickly. They're not sitting in chairs. No one sat in chairs at meals. It seems odd to us, but they are reclining on their left elbow. Their feet are back behind them, and they use their right hand to le reach over and grab the bread, dip it in the stew, and then eat it. So they are not sitting. They are laying down on their left elbow and eating with their right hand. So we have John is in the position of Jesus' right-hand man. Judas, wait for it, is in the guest of honor seat. And Peter is in the dunt seat. He's in the servant seat. Now, let me just take a moment to get you to realize what's happening here. Jesus has put everybody as the host and as the rabbi. He's put everybody in the seats in which they're sitting. We don't know where the other disciples were, but we know where Peter was, and we know where John and Judas were seated. And we know this by looking at the Scripture. Jesus is teaching always in his life, and he is delivering a message to both Judas to Peter, and to the remainder, the rest of the disciples. He's very purposeful about this. So let's take a look at this. The very beginning, Jesus says, and Luke, this is Luke 22, but you are not to be like that, not like these who try to show off and lord it over everybody. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest. Let's pause. Who is the youngest sitting at the table? It's John. And John is in the right-hand man seat. He's in the greatest seat. And Jesus says, the greatest who Peter thinks has got to be him. Peter, if you're going to be the greatest, you have to be like the youngest. If you want to sit in this, where the youngest man is sitting right now, here's what you have to do. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. Now, if we go back to this table arrangement, at this point, the servant should be getting up to wash everyone's feet. That's his job. That's what you did in that culture. So I can just imagine Jesus sitting there looking at Peter with that look like, are you going to do it? Are you going to serve? Are you going to wash everyone's feet? And I can just imagine the, the stare off because Peter's not going to do it. He's got way too much pride to wash the disciples' feet. So Jesus gets up and does it himself. And he walks all the way around washing each one of the disciples' feet. And finally he comes to Peter, and he came to Simon Peter, who was sitting in that last seat, and who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? So we know where Simon Peter, but we get even more clues. Now we know where Judas is sitting, and there'll be a couple more clues. I'm not referring to all of you who, when he says you're going to betray me, I know those I have chosen, but this is to fulfill this passage of Scripture. He who shared my bread has turned against me. Let's go back to this picture one more time. You see, as you sat leaning on your left shoulder and your right hand would reach over and grab the bread and dip it in the stew. They did not have spoons and forks and knives back then. And the host would lead off by dipping his bread in the stew and handing it to the guest of honor. So it's easy to see where Judas was, is seated. He who shared my bread has turned against me. Let's keep going. John, one of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him, which means he was on Jesus' right. 
Simon Peter motioned to this disciple and said, ask him which one he means about someone betraying him. Well, Peter can only, be, he can be the only disciple that can do that because he's sitting right across from John. Leaning back against Jesus, again, we see where John is sitting, just to the right of Jesus, not sitting, laying there about next to the table. He asked him, Lord, is, who is it? And Jesus answered, it is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread in the di of bread, he gave it to Judas, which is exactly what the host did. He starts the meal by taking the bread, leaning over, dipping it in the stew, and handing it to the guest of honor. So we can see where everyone is sitting. And there's a message that Jesus has given us. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you to this diagram again before we finish. What is the message to Judas that Jesus is giving, putting him in the guest of honor seat? Well, he's saying, I know what you're going to do. I know you're going to betray me. I love you anyway. I'm going to put you in the guest of honor seat, even though I know you're going to betray me. I want you to know I love you, even though you're going to betray me. He's saying that to Judas. But he's also, can you imagine the disciples, once they realize that, that Judas is the one that betrayed him, can you imagine them saying, do you realize he put him, he put him in the guest of honor seat? What in the world was he doing that for? And eventually, one of them would have had a light bulb go off and say, oh my gosh, he always taught us to love our enemies. And that's exactly what he was doing, even in this Passover meal. Now, what is he saying to Peter, putting him in this position, in the dunce seat, in the servant seat? He's saying, Peter, I know you want to be in the right-hand man seat. And that's the position I have for you. That's what I want for you. But you cannot start here. To be my right-hand man, you have to start in the guest seat. You have to, excuse me, you have to start in the servant seat. To be my right-hand man, you have to start in the servant seat. And that's what he says to us and to his disciples and us over and over. If you want to be the greatest, you have to be a servant. So the messages that we get the messages that we get from Jesus in just this sim simple seating arrangement is anything but simple. He's saying, love your enemies, even when you know they're going to betray you. And any of you, if you want to be great in the kingdom, if you want to be my right-hand man, you've got to start in the servant seat. Isn't it amazing how many little gems there are that we can mine out of this last week of what Jesus was doing each day? And then the, to conclude with this seating arrangement at the Last Supper with so many levels going on, so much teaching going on, uh, just living parables. I hope this has been helpful for you. It's so helpful for me to know what was happening, to walk through this with Jesus, to be with him during this crucial final week in these final hours. Think about this. Walk through this with Jesus. Be with him because he's always with you. Because there's more. And you know it. Because Jesus would say, come and find it. 